I am an environmental and uh, occupational safety consultant, and I am expanding into quality assurance as it relates to craft beer. So uh, this summer I've been teaching myself to be a brewing chemist, and um, that is really awesome. So fun fact, there is a mathematical formula to describe the stability of beer foam over time. That was a cool discovery. So, gosh, so back in 1999, uh, I was volunteering for City Repair Project, the organization that's still around in Portland today. Um, that's related to my architecture background. Um, so, um, I was being one of the more tech savvy volunteers that they had. So, every now and then, old computers would get donated um, by members of the community in, in the thought that that would be helpful. And as a lot of organizations found out, just having old computers dumped on them wasn't necessarily that helpful. But I uh, collected them and saved them. And after a while, you know, kept thinking, gosh, you know, one of these days I'm going to get these fixed up and we're going to give them out to activists so they have access to email and, and be better activists. So um, at some point, uh, City Repair starts working on a collaborative thing for Earth Day. And um, a gentleman from the, oh gosh, Green Earth Network, I think that was it, uh, hopefully we'll edit that better, yeah, Green Earth Network, um, it was one of the co-sponsors, they were doing the, the run portion of our event, and we were coordinating at my house, and he saw all the computers, and I, you know, kind of offhandedly told him, oh yeah, I'm going to fix them up, blah, blah, blah. And literally the next morning, he calls me and says, yeah, I talked to my executive director. He wants to give you $250 to file your 501c3 paperwork, and we've got 75 computers up here at Lewis and Clark that you can have. And um, it's like, wow, that was very easy. That happened very quickly. Um, I literally like left my house, got a cup of coffee, went and visited a friend and brainstormed out the name Free Geek, bought the domain on the spot, set up a website over the next few days with my terrible basic HTML skills, and um, within weeks I got an email from Jim Diebel, who uh, had just sold uh, an ISP here in, or in there in Portland and uh, was looking to invest in an education project and he found my website and wanted to talk and you know long story short we ended up with twenty five thousand dollars worth of initial funding and the naivete and audacity to sign a lease without any other known additional income um with a race to get a grant in time before the meager money that we had ran out and um and it, it works, it, it, it shouldn't have, it really, it really shouldn't have. And I think that you know, on some level that, that, that level of early success led to a, a certain level of naivete about how this was all gonna work out in the long term. And uh, you, you know how it goes, it gets complicated. So I was inspired to join Free Geek for two reasons. Um, the first reason was honestly that I had received tech uh, when I worked as a part of other nonprofit organizations that helped me do my job. So a lot of nonprofits don't have the budget to buy technology. Um, I was trying to bike back and forth to work at an environmental nonprofit and finding that I was carrying my laptop, which was one of my most precious uh, possessions at the time, and really risking falling on it because I'm a terrible biker. Um, and when Free Geek's grant program uh, became something that I was aware of, I applied for a grant, received a computer, and suddenly didn't have to, to make that trek every day with my laptop. Um, I also had that experience at other nonprofit organizations and helped several uh, other nonprofits get tech through that hardware grants program uh, that I love, that Free Geek still has. Um, in addition to that, I grew up uh, primarily in rural Idaho and uh, I didn't grow up with a lot of um, computers around and when I went to college I didn't actually have the basic like, typing skills that you would expect um, and I didn't have a computer 
so going to college without a computer when all of your papers are expected to be typed is a real challenge. I was also working full time. Um, my young brother was living at home with me and trying to make ends meet and get to the library after school hours so that I could type papers honestly felt impossible. Uh, and it ended up leading to me dropping out for a time before I ended up finishing my degree. So yeah, so when we started, um, Google was just becoming a thing that, you know, it wasn't quite a verb for everyone yet, but that happened like pretty quickly where like having access to Google and, and search was seen as the necessary thing for people to have. It wasn't really so much about email, although you know, that was like, that was my original concept was, was like, we just need to give people access to email. Um, but uh, yeah, access to search, I think, was the, the thing that we really thought that we needed to get people access to, you know, and an easy to use interface where they could Google things. Um, so, you know, and at the time, you know, giving people computers was a neat thing, um, you know, and on some level, even then, I was thinking, you know, gosh, you know, one of the really cool things that I do is I give people computers. And one of the really horrible things that I do is I give people computers because, um, you know, uh, the way that things have gone with technology and phones and the smartphone and all of those things, I mean, smartphones is something that we did not even see that coming um, at the beginning there. Um, you know, that, that distraction from life and living um, is, yeah, it, it's hard to be part of, of, of the tools that, that keep people in touch with reality. But, you know, the, the tool for knowledge and all of those things, it, it, it counterbalances, I hope. I've always thought the digital divide was striking. <laughs> Is that too honest? Um, I feel like the digital divide has always been a problem. And before the pandemic, um, I was constantly having these really intense conversations with people about why it mattered. And it was this kind of background issue that people knew existed, knew mattered, but it didn't seem that important. And then when the pandemic hit, everyone was suddenly aware of it. Um, I remember conversations with our marketing specialist where they were like, hey, the national news is talking about the digital divide today. Um, and in that way, that's been uh, an interesting side effect of the pandemic for us, right? Like there have been so many tragic things happening, um, but it's really highlighted the importance of the work that we're doing. And for that piece, um, I'm, I'm grateful that people are seeing the digital divide as the problem that it is. Uh, and the problem that's affected people for a really long time. Um, early free week. Um, you know, first, before we got the, the space, uh, but we had this offer of money. And so we, we got a board of directors together. We had meetings at uh, Portland State University with some guidance from experienced nonprofit professionals and crafted the mission statement, which is not that much different than the mission statement as it is today. That was, uh, took some care to, to do that. And, um, and then we looked for the space and we, we found that space in McGuire where they were just really friendly to the idea that we would sign a three month lease. And they were, they were, I guess maybe they were the only ones that agreed to a three month lease. So, cause that's all the money we had. We only, we could only afford a three month lease. So the idea was that, you know, at the end of three months, we wouldn't be moving all the stuff out again, um, with nowhere to put it. Um, and, uh, so we got that grant, um, from the city of Portland in partnership. Yeah. So it was from the DEQ. That's right. The grant was from the DEQ in partnership with the city of Portland and uh, very first grant I ever wrote. And again, naively get like immediate success. So now I think grant writing is easy. Uh, we do have some success with that, but yeah, it certainly was not as easy as I was led to believe. <laughs> So yeah, so we can rent that space um, for long term. But yeah, in the beginning, um, we had nothing in there. So we tore out the carpet, 
Um, I got some free doors donated from the uh, rebuilding center, and those became the um, the desks in the classroom space. And uh, yeah, a bunch of other donated lumber from the rebuilding center, and some donated paint from Metro. And um, we gussied things up as, as best we could, and opened the doors. And there was just me as the only staff person, and. Um, and no real marketing other than the website, kind of the word of mouth, and, and uh, nothing really happened. Um, but at some point, um, somebody from the city pointed somebody at the Oregonian to our website. And without really checking in with us, they put a thing in the paper saying, hey, Everybody can get a free computer, free geek. And um, the next day, I, I, I showed up early, seven o'clock in the morning. There's a line, 20, 13 people outside the door. And by the time nine o'clock rolled around, it was down to the corner. I mean, so many people signed up in the first 24 hours that we are, you know, it was hundreds of people long. It was completely unwieldy. We were never going to accommodate this many people, this many requests for computers. We had no build program. We had a handful of volunteers that could throw a few computers together every day. But it wasn't really a, a steady, established program. We weren't really expecting the volume that occurred because of that newspaper article. And um, so a waiting list was implemented. And that waiting list did end up being months long for the initial recipients. Well, we had to figure it all out and, and make it all work because now we had all this expectation, a lot of volunteers and a lot of hours waiting to get their computer. So, you know, luckily for us, the, the experience and, and the learning that people uh, were was able to obtain while volunteering kept them satisfied enough. So, when I started working as the development manager at Free Geek, um, Free Geek in some ways looked really similar to the way it looks now. Um, and our physical space has been the same for a really long time. So we occupy um, a warehouse in Southeast Portland. Uh, it's about 25,000 square feet. Um, we have streamlined and changed processes a lot in the last uh, year or so, obviously related to the pandemic and then some prior to that, just trying to make our space more accessible and more friendly to the public. Yeah, I think my first week at Free Geek, one of the most telling incidents that happened for me was um, we had a digital inclusion manager and she was a like an N10 fellow who was hired through that program. She was doing amazing work, just really thinking through how to make technology more accessible and coming up with these brilliant projects to make it work better. And she was doing all of this work entirely by herself and it felt so impossible. Um, and so we would sit down, you know, once a week and have a conversation around what it is that she needed funding for, because that was my job. And she would express to me all of the challenges and how she really, you know, was trying to give away as many computers as possible to the people who needed them most, trying to make sure people got the skills that they needed. And it was an insurmountable task. And so one of the very first things that I tried to fund at Free Geek was hiring um, an associate level digital inclusion professional to help her. Um, what's really fun for me now is that that person is a manager of ours and they are managing several people doing digital inclusion work. Um, and it's been amazing to see that team grow, but it's also been so inspirational to see their work grow. So not just is that like that team hasn't just gotten bigger, the impact that they're making has become really really large and um, I've also really appreciated watching that team become more representative of the community that we're trying to serve and really being mindful of connecting the right dots for folks so that when they're reaching out into the community have, they have the right connections to actually make that work meaningful. You know that initial funding was very short term 
um, and with just a ridiculous amount of overconfidence, we just barreled on forward. Um, but you know, at some point, we were able to write a successful large grant um, of something like uh, two hundred and sixty thousand dollars, I think, from Myra Memorial Trust, and that's when we went from three people getting paid next to nothing for the amount of time that they were putting in, myself, Richard, and Laurel. Um, and then all of a sudden we had money for staff and healthcare for staff. And um, yeah, it was a big moment. And also just like, then it just became this like, also just much more serious responsibility because now there's this like payroll. There's all these people, not just the three of us kind of splitting the money that was available, but people with expectations for a paycheck and expectations that we're able to, you know, make the premium payments on the health care and all of those responsibilities that, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was the root of sort of the root awakening. We had money, but now we had, uh, we had real responsibility to, to be responsible with that money and to, you know, be successful and, and prove we were worthy of getting funding like that and, and not letting down all the people that we hired. Um, that was probably my biggest headache and just constant source of worry was that, are we going to make payroll? And then after we got a, a grant, then yeah, then everybody was getting paid. Nothing, you know, spectacular, but like for a nonprofit and with the addition of actual health care um, and the, the autonomy of, of the workplace that we had created you know that little three-person collective grew um it's 2021 we survived 2020 and i feel like that was a set of challenges in and of itself um we obviously were hit by the pandemic um, a lot of our business model was us being there in person um, we were able to pivot very quickly and we owe a lot of thanks to the community that really showed up to support us um, and to give donations essentially to make it possible for us to continue giving computers away when we weren't able to um, make our income up in the same ways that we had before. Um, that was a huge challenge. I think the other challenges that we're facing are kind of cultural shift challenges. So. Um, Free Geek is a tech company, and as a part of the tech company, um, we are often faced with the same challenges that every other technology company are faced with. Um, we, for a long time, saw that our staff looked one certain way, um, and now we're really shifting the way that our staff looks um, and the way that they engage with each other. And we're really trying to have an open dialogue and a culture that accepts constant feedback and improvement. Uh, and that's challenging. Um, as a boss, I can tell you every day I wake up and it's challenging, um, but I'm also really grateful for it in a really real way. The adoption program. And um, that was the very first concept that we came up with before we even opened up the doors um, and we had started to bring the open source community in. They, they showed up at our table at Earth Day and were the very first volunteers that signed up. Richard, actually, who was uh, instrumental in the, the success of early Free Geek and, and long-term Free Geek. I mean, Richard's crucial to all of that. Well, he's the very first volunteer that signed up on my sheet at Earth Day in 2000. And um, so that open source community led us um, to Linux and open source uh, software is the solution for our old hardware and um, the penguin mascot became like adopt a penguin I guess was, was the theme that we, we attempted to come up with uh, to tell that story um, and um, that's how it began so we had this idea that you I think we actually thought you'd volunteer for as little as four hours to get a computer because uh, we hadn't really done any of this there was no model to work from so people started showing up we started giving them things to do 
and eventually it settled out on like 24 hours. It's a number that people can get their head around. It, it gets us enough momentum of getting things done that that seems like a fair trade. Programs are everywhere at Free Geek. So the way that we think about the work now isn't that like one program exists, it's that everything that we do is a program. So we have our recycling program where people drop off tech and it can't be refurbished and it gets recycled. And that's a program, that's a service that we offer. Uh, that means that less e-waste is out in the community potentially um, causing pollution and that's an amazing program. Uh, we also have our tech refurb program where we refurbish technology. Uh, we have all of our digital inclusion programs um, and those are numerous. Um, we have our Get to Geek Box program that really is a way that volunteers um, who had worked with us primarily prior to the pandemic can give back their volunteer hours and turn those volunteer hours into computers for members of the community that might need a device. Um, there's also uh, programs like our Plug Into Portland program that targets K-12 students and gets them the device that they need. Um, we have programs like Welcome to Computers um, that targets people out in the community and, and goes to them and gets them the devices that they need. So really, we're trying to get people a computer no matter how they might qualify, whether that's through one of our low-cost tech programs where you can buy a device at a lower rate, um, or if it's a way that we can give you free technology. We really want to get technology in the hands of those who need it most and to make sure that they're supported in using that technology. Yeah, so I think that on some level, you know, it was a lot of fun for, for volunteers and for the public. I think that the cost benefit analysis probably wouldn't really support doing it. You know, back then we also did like Smashtacular. So Smashtacular was the unbelievably liability ignoring concept of having volunteers with sledgehammers beat the heck out of old printers and listen to punk rock while they did it. And um, and we did that. So they would be out there by the back door with a sledgehammer swinging away at a printer with bits flying and, you know, some safety equipment. But yeah, I don't know that that would be something I would endorse now. And I believe that at that same geek fair, we actually strapped a bucket seat or a bench seat from a van to the forklift forks and gave people a ride 30 feet up in the air on the forklift forks strapped into the seat of the, the chair that we had strapped to the forklift forks. Oh man, geek prom. Yeah, so we, Free Geek has a really unique culture. Um, we are accepting and kind of radical in a way that I find inspirational every day. Um, and so to me, our like big event was really about celebrating that culture and celebrating the work that we can do when we come together. Um, Free Geek is not a place for um, the fanciest of people to necessarily rub elbows. It's really a place that accepts everyone where they are. Uh, and collectively, we can make a huge difference. And so I think, for me, that was really the inspiration for having a major event. Um, and it was really fun. I hope that we can have in-person events in the future. I think uh, the unique culture of Free Geek really creates a lot of fun. Um, and I hope to have more of those. I also really love the Geek Fair model and in ways would like to bring that back. <laughs> I feel like there are some nightmares that I have around liability insurance related to that, but it's really exciting to me. Yeah, so I have uh, kept an eye on all the last 16 years. Um, and I think that the, the latest um, iteration that I see uh, impresses me the most. It really does. The, the, the diversity of leadership and um, the, the real professional vibe that I get from the social media interaction, the, 
um, the way that everyone presents themselves um, in in my interactions is definitely a little step above where we were. Um, and uh, yeah, no, you guys are like uh, like a professional nonprofit organization. I'm, I'm beyond happy. I'm gonna I'm gonna get choked up here if I'm not careful. So yeah, I'm very happy to see the free geek that y'all have become. It's good. I would say that Free Geek's main goal, from my perspective, hasn't changed at all. Um, I've always thought of Free Geek as this kind of unique circular model where we saw two societal problems, one being e-waste and the other being the digital divide, and we opted to point those problems back at each other to solve them both. So instead of trying to solve them individually, we're really working on both of those issues at the same time, and I think that that has been the single thing that has stayed a part of Free Geek since the, since the beginning. Um, for actually a, a, a while, you know, I've, I've, I've used my architecture background to design different versions of Free Geek. You know, the block next door, the block that y'all are on. So yeah, so in 10 years, you know, I would like to see Free Geek own its own property, its building, a recycling center, an education center, custom made for your needs. Um, that, that would be, that'd be something. And, uh, you know, it's something, yeah, I've actually given it like so much thought um, over the years. Um, that uh, one day, hopefully, that's a, a project we can all work on together. Um, so yeah, so if I could do something for Free Geek and right now, it would be to buy y'all a building. <laughs> so yeah, no, I think that that um, you know that that level of, of financial stability would be amazing. That you would be able to purchase a, a piece of property and develop it with a um, you know either a, an existing warehouse that gets refurbished or, you know, ideally a fresh start so that everything is, is to Free Geek's very specific needs and uh, with an eye to growth and, and, a, and a long, long future. So, yeah, those are the things I'd like to see. I hope that Free Geek looks um, just like the audience that we're trying to serve. I hope that the people who are running Free Geek have all experienced the digital divide. I hope that um, all of our staff are really reflective of the communities that they're working with. Um, and I hope that we're a whole heck of a lot more effective. I think Free Geek has grown in its effectiveness over the last two decades. Um, I think that'll continue and I'm really, really excited for it. I feel like uh, we have this really wonderful foundation that we've been building on for years and I'm excited to see it continue to grow um, in its impact and also in its uh, really justice-oriented work. You guys noticed the treehouse. So, a few years in, we mission drifted off into software development, open source software development. And so, as part of that project, there was um, an individual who was uh, working on a medical records database, and he was based out of Staten Island, out of a VA hospital there. And we, myself and a gentleman named Ron, who was uh, on staff, able to run the software project, had been invited out to the N10 conference in Philadelphia. So we flew out to Philadelphia, and we, there was several things going on on that trip. There was also the, the Free Geek Pen, was one of the first satellite Free Geek organizations to try to start up, it was also doing its thing. So we were visiting them, going to N10 for the weekend, um, also doing the Penguin Day conference, which was uh, a follow-up to the N10 conference on the Sunday after, and then um, and then we went to Staten Island to visit with uh, 
this gentleman whose, whose name escapes me. I, hopefully I'll be able to look that up for you. But so we stayed at his house in Staten Island for the night um, before we flew back. And it turns out he was the vice president of the Communist Party of the United States of America. And super nice guy. Yeah, when I showed up, he had made this Oso and Free Geek themed with coffee cup um, birdhouse for me. And um, yeah, he was just a really nice guy. And his son was there, and I think his son was like 13 at the time. And that evening, his uh, membership, uh, junior membership in the the Communist Party of the United States of America showed up and he was all excited. And so his dad told me a story. And like when he was in the first or second grade, his teacher called him and said, um, you know, your son is calling all of his classmates class traitors. Do you have an explanation for this? And he's like, well, I think it's because petty bourgeois is too hard for him to pronounce. And, uh, yeah, I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs>